Okay, it looks like we're good. We're live now. Fifty, would you like to introduce everyone? Yeah, okay. Or you, you prefer introducing yourselves? Oh, we could do that. Okay, so um after after my introductory comment, I will now um give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. If that is okay with you. Oh uh, <laughs> okay. Or I should I'm introduce not... you. Whichever whichever way I'm okay. It's okay. You um, are a leader, Gifty. Okay. All right. So I'll be introducing you. So do we start? We're live. We are live. Okay. okay. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone watching us live. Um, you are warmly welcome to today's episode of Communication Talk. And um, as you are aware, we just celebrated the World Press Freedom Day. And the theme for this year's um, celebration was information as public good. Now, it is important to note that information can only be public good if it is not fake, but it is factual, it is objective, with fair and balanced representation of all the sides of a story. So on today's, epi on today's episode of Communication Talk, we are going to have a look at fake news and its detection around the globe because now it is a global phenomenon. And with me to do justice to the topic are Prof. Sabi from the Communication Science Faculty of Uni Nitwendo University in Rome, Italy. Um, we also have Dr. George Rodman from the Television and Radio Department of Brooklyn College of the University in New York, USA, and Prof. Octavio, a communication researcher from the Central University of Ecuador. Gentlemen, you are warmly welcome to today's episode. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, without wasting much time, let us start. Now, um, let me start by asking each of our discussants to share their experience of the fake news phenomenon in their jurisdiction. So um, let us let us start with um, Prof. Sabi. Um, what is the experience like in your jurisdiction? Let's. Uh, I would like to quote Jonathan Swift, the famous Irish satiric and writer from the 17th century. He said, and he wrote, falsehood lies, flies, but the truth comes limping after. So, in regards to the ju uh, jurisdiction, it's, in today's world, it's global. Why I'm saying this? For example, uh, fake news is an excellent issue for the dictatorships in democracy. And we have to uh, be focused more on a priori, not a posteriori. That means that we are uh, acting after something happens. We have to act before something happens. For that, we need, as I'm always saying, media ethics and media literacy to be discovered mm -hmm. and to be and, and to be uh, lectured. In the same time, uh, jurisdiction, I can mention, for example, latest example from Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, even Italy, when uh, the, uh, the governments adjust the news according to their needs within the pandemics. For example, elections, suddenly, suddenly there are no more cases. The, uh, the wave has passed. And now we are uh, now we can do the elections. Exactly the same thing I noticed the last summer. It was the uh, first three months of the pandemic when I went to Croatian coast, and it was three days before the general elections in Croatia. And they said, "Pandemic is out. We won against pandemic." You know what has happened ten days after elections? It was even worse than it was before. So what I said at the beginning, uh, uh, jurisdiction doesn't mean the same is everywhere around the world. This is the main problem is this is the excellent tool and democracy has failed in this issue around the world. All right. Um, thank you very much, Prof. Um, um, Doc Rodman, what, 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 what is your take? Well, uh, the problem of fake news, 
for me is a problem of humanity because people have lied since they have learned how to talk. Uh, it's interesting that you have brought up the theme of information as a public good because it was the idea of information as a public good that started the whole idea of fake news because fake news began with governments and businesses and organizations lying because they believed that was the best thing for the public, that that's what they needed. So we have a whole history of what we call spin and deception and misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. They're all defined differently, but they're all the basically, they're all basically the idea of lying strategically because uh, it's the right thing to do for the goals that are in front of the table right now. So governments, for example, will lie about their espionage services because they don't want their um, agents, their secret agents, to, to be killed by the foreign governments that they are investigating. So uh, it's, it's that idea of truth being turned uh, uh, strategically in order to perform certain goals. So from the beginning of news, when we, we first had news, news was just announcements that were made by ancient leaders. And those were always made uh, for their benefit. And bad news was suppressed and good news was, um, was stressed. And it has just gone on like that. And today, it has, there, there's two new phenomena today. The, the first is that there's so much information available. We have so many instant information sources and um, the internet allows us to disseminate information so quickly. Uh, and the other thing is we've gone overboard with disinformation because people are willing to believe it. Here in the United States, we have two alternate versions of the truth. We have the conservative truth and we have the liberal truth, uh, the Democratic Party truth and the Republican truth. And they don't care whether or not the news is true. They care whether or not it f performs their um, their goals, their objectives. So the conservatives in the United States, you know, basically have the idea, like conservatives all over the world, they, they have the idea that it is in the public good for business to operate as profitably as possible. It's good for the economy, therefore it's good for everyone. In order for business to operate, uh, as to flourish as much as possible. It has to have a lack of regulation. In order to get people to support that lack of regulation, we give them stories, stories that resonate with them, stories that they want to believe. Um, it's also in the interest of the country, according to the conservative point of view, to have low taxes, if we have taxes at all. And low taxes means fewer public services, uh, all of which can be sold to the public that needs those public services with particular stories. And those stories are strategic truth to begin with, but they become false or misleading information presented as news. They become disinformation campaigns and they become very successful in this age of the internet. And that's my take. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rodman. Let us now um, take the view of Prof. Octavio. Prof, what is the situation like in Ecuador? Well, uh, not in Ecuador. Uh, I am Mexican. I have been living in Ecuador for about uh, six years. 
uh, let me tell you what I think about fake news. Uh, we used to think that fake news is a phenomenon created by, by media. I rather think about fake news as a military strategic. Uh, I mean, uh, the horse of Troya, lies that you use for special operations, all history, uh, all the history. Uh, so I am concerned about the effects of uh, fake news in the web. Tim Berners-Lee, who created the web, he introduced it the 12th of March, 1989. Uh, is very worried about the effects of fake news in internet. Internet is a wonderful uh, thing. Uh, we are making too many stupid things on internet. And he is, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, is uh, telling us that uh, Facebook is doing a bad thing about promoting fake news, which is a big, a very powerful industry. We have to think uh, fake news as a powerful industry. Who, uh, the ones, governments, parties, institutions uh, that are paying for fake news are creating too many things to distract the people, to create confusion. And, and, and it's very, uh, we have to be very worried about it. But we have to think uh, uh, fake news as, an, as a powerful industry that is creating a lot of troubles in the communications at the internet. Uh, too many people, uh, want to rep replicate information as fast as possible. They don't have the instruction, the uh, um, digital alphabet literacy to behave responsible, to see, to find out if you can trust in the information that you are going to, to, to replicate or not. And we have to to begin to solve this big trouble, uh, trying to, to promote this digital alphabetization. alphabetization. So uh, governments, too many institutions, even universities can do a great effort to, to contain the propagation of fake news. How? Educating people. Educating people to behave better in digital environments. We cannot stop this powerful industry, but we can, can work to do our best effort to educate not only our students, not on, only our college, uh, the society as a, uh, as a destinators of this effort to uh, digital alphabet alphabetization. That's All right. what I think. All right. All right, Prof. Otavio, thank you very much. Now, um, gentlemen, you all agree with me that um, um, centuries ago, fake news has been around for centuries, but it, um, it became popular um, after the 2016 US election and the Brexit. That, that, that is when it became so popular. Now, you all agree with me that um, Fake, the issue of fake news is a common knowledge. Everybody knows that um, it is not every information that is um, genuine. There is information disorder where we have disinformation, malinformation, and misinformation. Yet, surprisingly, you realize that fake news keep thriving despite the knowledge. People are aware of fake news. Yet, um, it, it seems to be thriving. Now, what is causing fake news to try despite this common knowledge that there is information this other out there now let me start with um doc rodman what what do you think is the reason for this situation well uh fake news is thriving today because as i said before people want to believe it it uh it fits in with their uh, uh predetermined prejudices and now 
in the United States and all over the world, there are, there are media channels that look like mainstream media channels that are essentially disinformation channels. Here in the United States, the most popular cable channel is Fox News. Fox News is a disinformation channel. It constantly um, presents fake news in all of its uh, uh, definitions, all of the definitions that we've talked about today. Um, they make false connections, headlines, visuals, or captions that don't support the contents of the article that they're talking about. They present misleading content. Uh, they, they misuse information in order to frame an issue in a way that is not appropriate to that issue. Uh, they provide false context to information. When genuine content, content is shared with false contextual information, it has the potential to undermine trust in serious uh, news coverage. Um, Fox News and now its, uh, its competitors who do the same thing are uh, are doing are presenting all of this for a particular objective without without any shame, and because they have um, they have competitors now uh, on American cable television. Fox News is the most popular, but there's also a cable channel called One American News, and another one called Newsmax, which are doing the same thing. There's three misinformation channels and they um, are very similar in the way that they, they pick up a particular story and they all present that story and they all present it from the same point of view. Uh, of course, the big example is President uh, uh, Trump, Trump saying mm -hmm. that he won the election and that the election was, uh, was bogus. And uh, mm -hmm. it, that it's not true at all, but they will run that particular story. And right now on all three channels, they are reporting that um, President Biden has um, proposed cutting the American consumption of beef 90% total fiction. It has nothing to do with reality, but they just, they announce that as the news and then they go on and on and on talking about what a terrible thing it is. Uh, Prof, um, let me, let me interrupt you a little. Now, um, is it, is it possible that it is because of economic gains? that um, Fox keep mm -hmm. running that false information because like you said, it is popular. Now, um, regarding the issue about um, Trump claiming that he won the election and it was bogus, I remember when Fox ran that story, many people were um, listening, streaming, list, um, assessing that information. And so Fox was getting more audience, but when CNN, tried to counter um, that story, CNN was losing its audience. So is it possible that economic gains is the motivation for them constantly running fake stories because they know it is fake, but they are looking at the economic gains. Is, is yeah. that possible? Economic gain in two ways. First, it increases, their it increases their audience and therefore it's advertising revenue. But also, mm -hmm. it's, it's doing the larger job of reducing regulations, reducing taxes, uh, generally making it easier for corporations and wealthy people like Rupert Murdoch to keep more of the money that they make, <coughs> which is the big fiction. I mean, the very big fiction is that the government takes your money, which is 
so ridiculous. The government creates your money. The government makes it possible for you to make 100% of your money so that when they collect 30% of your money, it's still 70% to the good that you wouldn't have if the government wasn't there operating the economic system for you. But the, the big lie that goes on to make Fox News and the entire Murdoch uh, conglomerate money is that the government takes your money and it takes your money for to give it to other people, to give it to people who don't believe, who don't deserve it. It's a very, very big lie and a, a very um, believable one to people who are not media literate, to people who don't know how to interpret um, false messages. Okay. Now, thank you very much, um, um, Doc Rodman. Now, Prof. Sabi, there is also this um, issue that um, prevalent of technological innovations, especially new media technologies and easy access to these technologies is um, the reason why um, fake news is thriving, despite the knowledge of inf information disorder. What is your take on that? Uh, just to say, it's only partially true. Because uh, 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 doesn't matter if you are media literate. Is it uh, uh, going to go, uh, read the newspaper or you're going to go online and do something? So it's only partially true because uh, usually journalists, uh, the the ones who are using abusing fake news, it's easy to copy paste because in today's world, eighty percent of information lie are trash. Mm -hmm. And it's easy, it's easy to uh, copy and paste to be fast as much as possible, especially mm -hmm. as colleague said in Fox News, they are established cable channel, which uh, at um, a majority of media literate people believes, and they are source for other fake news delivers and those ones, and it's, it's go just, just go up and up and up, bigger stories and they spread around the world. My, my proposal is always, now we can all agree today on the issue that fake news exists and always will exist like corruption. But we have to diminish it. And how to diminish it? As, uh, just to say what I'm saying all the time, media literacy from the primary school, creating critical thinking or questioning everything. And I'm, my, my first sentence when I enter the class is always, I would like you to show me that I'm wrong. And then suddenly, uh, uh, one of them will jump out, but they don't know how to defend the thesis. Our goal is to learn together how to defend the thesis until the end of the semester. Same with the people. That's the only solution is to establish the, the, the edu education, as Octavia said, but in media literacy, plus media ethics among the journalism. Very professional journalist is ethical one. Yes. Because he has to respect the public, He's there for public, he has to respect the editorial board, and he has to respect the common goal. The issue of, about the new technologies is another tool. Remember, not even one media has destroyed the previous one. He just upgraded it. Now we have to use this beautiful, uh, beautiful sense of technology to develop the knowledge, not the ignorance. Uh, how to fight them, a priori, in the school. Mm -hmm. And okay, we um, also have um, to, uh, well, just to say, we have to have fact checking. Uh, we have, to, for example, for this today's session, I, I would like to, to make International Communication Club to send a message to all uh, governments in the world to establish within the professional journalist associations everywhere fact checking group or fact checking um, sites mm -hmm. in Prof, every country in the world. Prof, um, yes. we, we, we will uh, move on to um, finding. Um, solutions to it in a jiffy. But um, let me quickly ask um, Prof. Otavio. Um, in your presentation, you, you were talking about the fact that um, people are reckless, okay, and um, they are ready to put that wrong information into the system. Now, is it possible that because people are reckless because of the anonymity that these technologies afford them? That is why they are putting false information out there. Oh, that's dangerous. Uh, governments that want to spy uh, the people around the world are very interested in knowing who you who you are. So anonymity, uh, it's a, a privilege if you behave well. But 
as Edward Snowden had demonstrated, uh, if the governments of the big tech companies have very a lot of information from you, uh, you you could be extortion by this institution and this as the government uh, in Mexico. Uh, two weeks ago, the government left uh, uh, political and as Manuel López Obrador tried to promote um, a law that has uh, that you have to give your name and biological information about you uh, to the government to create a, a big list of who are using cell phones. If you have a government that wants to manipulate, that can control the, the information, four years ago, when they tried to do something like that, some people stole the information. So your data uh, was uh, uh, sale to to people that want to make uh, uh, bad things with your information. Tele uh, telephone extortions, uh, kidnapping, uh, too many things. So I guess that it could be dangerous. If we give more information, they have it. But the way that they can use it, it's a terrible uh, thing. I am really worried not about the fake news spread by media. I also want you to, want to share with you my worries about those independent fake news producer. It's a very big industry, True. Bots, and they uh, work as uh, as creating rumors. Uh, you can see that rumors have been part part of the communication history. But right now, to spread a rumor or also a fake news, it's uh, very easy, as, as, as Professor Sabe este said, but they are making money. They are working with parties, with, they are, are working with politicals uh, from left to right to create this fake news to, to manipulate public opinion. Uh, as Twitter, uh, those uh, trend topics that you can try to to fight against, creating new uh, ways to see the information, it's uh, a way to manipulate uh, uh, public opinions. Uh, so I insist we have to prepare to educate more our students all and all the people. Of course, ethic is uh, fundamental in media and, and in citizens, so they can uh, check out if the information that they are receiving, it's, uh, you can trust on it or, wait a minute, this is a fake news and it can make a lot of damage to many people. So I won't, won't spread it. I won't be part of this, uh, this thing, it's education. Uh, if I may add something, what you said, dear colleague, if I'm allowed by Gifty. Uh, I can, we can hear you, Gifty. We can hear you. Yeah, Prof, you can go uh, ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to add one thing, uh, what your colleague Octavio said, and also a link to the spin mentioning by, by George earlier. Uh, look, uh, the problem of laws in regards mm -hmm. to online technologies we have around the world, for example, if there is a law, if there is no law in any country that will regulate that you cannot, with nickname, be registered, you can see on Facebook or, or false name to be registered on Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else, that be, that would be much of help because uh, uh, people sometimes change real world with, with uh, 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 online world because what they cannot do in real world, they do in virtual world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, try to be the same everywhere, and you will see the answers and and what we're going to get. If if we are obliged by the law that that act with my with my total name everywhere, that 
will be one of, of the positive things in regards to fighting fake news. Also, in one on one issue, just uh, uh, continuing what you mentioned about this, the Italian. All right. Okay, so um, like um, you rightly said, um, people do different thing when they are in the virtual world, and then they do different thing when they are um, in the real world, and um, they are able to do this and get away with it because they can um, create an account with um, their aliases, and then they get away with it. Now, is it is it possible that? we can hold um, these social media platforms, we, we, we can make them to be more accountable, whereby um, they, they, they make sure that um, people will not just um, use their aliases to create an account but and then use- that doesn't them. suit the governments. That doesn't suit the governments. Governments loved it because they can then use those boats to do whatever they would like to do. <laughs> Mm. All right, um, um, Prof. Uh, Doc Rodman, what do you also think? Um, the there is the problem of uh, free speech, and we have to be very careful about solutions that do more damage than good in the okay. long run. Um, we've always believed that the solution to bad speech is more speech, not the suppression of speech. Mm -hmm. so, um, right now in the United States, there is a huge controversy about um, Facebook and Twitter denying a former president of the United States access to their platforms. Totally unheard of in a free speech society of any kind. And yet those tech giants feel that they have to do that because Trump lies, and his lies mm -hmm. have proven to be fatally dangerous. Um, it's, it's a very strange thing within the free speech society. Our politicians today will get on cable television shows and even mainstream shows, and they'll say, you're not fair to me because when my opponent speaks, you say, yes that's the truth but when i speak you say no that's a lie you should not do that you should let both of us speak and then the people can decide what's a lie and what's the truth and it sounds so reasonable when they say that but essentially he's saying i want to lie and i want access to my lies to be equal to everyone else's access to truth so it's it's an amazing time where we just have to we have to keep believing in the um in the power of free speech and in the, in the power of people to eventually um evolve to learn to the point where they will be media media literate we, we there's some simple lessons that we should teach um as, as soon as students begin using media to form opinions in elementary school, we have to tell them to consider the source. Go, go away from one source and look at other sources. Look, yeah. look at sources that have a different point of view. Um, check on the author of, of this particular piece of information. Check your own biases. That's the that's the big media literacy trick is to say, where, where are my biases? And how is that causing me to believe this piece of information that might or might not be true? In my case, I happen to be a political liberal. Uh, most academics in the United States are, are liberals because we have been subjected to a liberal arts education and mm -hmm. we have been taught to think for ourselves and research information and you know it just comes out of um the liberal tradition and it's very difficult for us to check our biases i very often see um brilliant academicians brilliant liberal thinkers who 
will will take a meme from the internet that is based on fake news and propagate it. They will they will copy it to their web website, to their feed, to their news feed, and let lots of other people see it. When it's it's not the truth, it just shows, for example, what an idiot Trump is or what an evil person Trump is, but it, it wasn't true to begin with. And I have to check them and I have to say, you ought not to do that. You're playing the other person's game and plus you're allowing the other side to say, see, there you don't tell the truth about Trump. You're always lying about Trump. And very often I get the response of, like, yeah, it's not true, but it, it's the kind of thing that would be true about Trump. It's the, it's the um, uh, you know, it's the artistic truth. It's the, it's the, it's the human truth. And, and that's <laughs> it's such a, a strange thing. And I'm very sensitive to this. My own training was in two areas. I was trained at the University of Southern California as a communication researcher, but I, I was also in the Department of Cinema and Television. I was also essentially learning about storytelling and, and why stories resonate with certain uh, people and, and the best stories resonate universally. And it just is so amazing. We have to teach people to check their biases and, and to recognize their biases. It's the basis of critical thinking and it's the most difficult lesson to teach. Yeah, it is the most difficult lesson to teach indeed. Now, um, what I want to find out is, do you think um, our curriculum is really equipping our students that is preparing them to be able to be media literate enough to distinct factual information from fake information? Prof. Octavio, let me start with you. Do, do you oh. think our curriculum is doing a good job in that regard? No, I don't think so. Uh, I am thinking also about uh, artificial intelligence or as a way to, to control these things or to contribute. It's not the whole solution, but it can do a great, uh, it can bring great benefits. I mean, Facebook knows also Twitter knows who are producing this fake news. I am talking about independent fake news producers. So please use in artificial intelligence to, to control it. You can do it better. I mean, you can work with algorithms to make some kind of signals or preventions, not to eliminate, but also make warnings those warnings can be very helpful to people to decide do i can i believe in this information it's an information so credible to propagate it or let's wait all right please so um, use better so algorithms and artificial intelligence and in in education your question as i understood it was about education. I think that in universities we can do a, a better work that we are that we are doing. Maybe we can we haven't think about how how dangerous it is to create an an environment full of lies. So ethics is fundamental and also uh, habits as a researcher to investigate about the information and don't don't become <clears throat> fake news producers. I mean professors, students, also the institutions. And if we can do this work, maybe we can contribute to, to change uh, a society as an example of that we are doing something very responsible. Thank you, Prof. Otavio. Now, Prof. Sabi, um, what is your take on our curriculum and its ability to equip our students to um, distinct fake 
news from factual news? I am more pro elementary school startup than mm -hmm. uh, the faculty because we are receiving all these shaped up people. Uh, 19, 20 years old are already shaped up. They they brought th their heritage, their knowledge from the primary and secondary school. We have to start up at least from the, the uh, late grades of, of the primary school with, with media literacy at least and uh, teaching them not uh, Okay, we say that 40 percent of everything they bring from home, but 60 percent it can be shaped by society, the environment. Uh, what school can do? Starting from the eight, seventh or eighth and fighting against biases, our own biases, our prejudices as well. For example, I have my own formula, which I'm, uh, which can be used as well for this: rights equal responsibility. That means as many rights in everything equal as many responsibilities. Responsibility equal empathy. And empathy equal uh, equality. This is also how to fight fake news. That means that we we are, if you want a, a society of, of social justice. When I say social justice, it's utopia anywhere because, especially in this corporate capitalism around the world. But uh, me as well as liberal, as always been, as all academics should be, uh, because uh, open-minded uh, thinkers accepting uh, even our mistakes when we do the mistakes. Uh, unless some people are using the fake news, as, as Colleague Rodman said, uh, yes, it's good, but it sounds very nice that it might happen like this. Uh, the problem is about curriculum, is what curriculum has been made by people who live in, in, a, in a 20th, 50th, uh, in 20th century. For example, I have my own colleagues who didn't change syllabuses for four or five years. Knowledge changed every 12 hours in the world because of development of science and everything. And they, for example, if I, every year, I, at least I change my syllabus anywhere. But if you, for example, use the book of 10 years ago to teach students, what about you're gonna teach in the book old of 10 years, for example, only partially? It's not, not everybody is not Marshall McLuhan or you know somebody who is who is who who led to us understanding of media issue and everything. Because everything changes, and we have to adopt to those changes, especially in curriculum fighting the fake news. Because believe me, right now when we are talking, again, I'm going to repeat, 80% of the information online are trash. Not to call it just fake, but trash. All right. Um, thank you, Prof. Savi. So um, now it is all obvious that um, our curriculum is not doing enough to equip um, our students so that um, um, they can detect um, um, fake news from factual news. Now, let, let, let's, in summing up, um, what do you think is the way forward when it comes to um, fighting fake news? At least we, we, there is the need for us to do something about this menace so that we control it. Now, what is the way forward? Let me start with Dr. Rodman, what, what do you think is the way forward? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I think universities globally are doing a great job to fight the epidemic of fake news. The, the real problems of fake news are happening to, to people who either were never university students or were resistant university students who came to the university and said, um, you know, this whole idea of, of investigating and science and everything else, it, I just, I don't approve of it, I don't believe of it, and it, you're not going to teach me anything. There is that type of student, they're a great minority, thank goodness. Very often it's because of uh, religious beliefs, very often it's just because of cultural laziness. They come from a, a particular uh, family situation in which they don't investigate things because things are very, um, it's very difficult to investigate things. But the, the general problem we have to fight against all the time is the death of expertise. The fact that expertise is not trusted as much as it should be. And that's what we do on the college level. We do it every day and we do it the best that we can. We, we teach our students that there is such a thing as expertise, that their 
opinion is welcome, but it's not necessarily um, as um, as valid as the opinion of an expert. It's not based on the same kind of facts. There's a difference between beliefs and knowledge and information. Um, and we teach that every day in every class. So I think we, we just have to the keep the keep the rudder steady on the ship. We have to we have to keep doing what we're doing and do it as well as possible. It's something that we have to do, but it's nice to do it well. And what I like about uh, the university education is that it's self-correcting. We don't want to be bad teachers. We want to have really good influence on our students' lives. And we just, we need to continue that. And, um, and that's what I, what I plead for everyone to do. You don't have to change the system. The system's working. Just be as good at it as you can. All right. Thank you very much. Now, uh, gentlemen, I wish we can, we can go on and on and on and on, but um, we don't have much time. So um, um, your final words, please. Um, let me start with um, Prof. Sabi, your final words. Well, um, within the deep polarized societies, it's very possible to spread the fake news. As the real news, the fake news spread out. The real goal and the words that came out from here and towards the countries, all countries in the world is to establish the fact checking point through the regular mm -hmm. news organization, uh, professional news organizations. Also to send, a, uh, to, to send the message to the government to encrypt the educational process with much more benefit for the professors uh, on all levels because we all know when somebody comes and asks a question why daddy you don't have two two shops uh, two bars and uh, my friend doesn't have a, a knowledge at school and he has much more salary than you are the professors i know professors in, in america that work two jobs just to survive in, in the, the world of of living and also anywhere in the world respect the professionals within the professors and i and i hope that the fighting fake news through media literacy and media ethics will be the ultimate goal for the future to come thank you prof savi now um prof octavio your your last words well uh, we have to fix the internet we have to fix too many media we have to fix our societies i mean polarization is one of the uh, worst effects of uh, fake news. We saw a terrible image in the USA uh, on the first days of January, 6th of January, a tribes assaulting the Congress of the USA was a very bad example of uh, losing the best of uh, democracy. Uh, social networks, social media, Facebook uh, are in too many ways responsible of that. Uh, we have to make too many changes. I guess that one change could be about uh, monopolist practice. The USA government has made uh, a very good uh, enforcement to change Facebook, to change Google, to change uh, too many of these big tech companies that are, are a very terrible monopolist. Uh, and they are making a lot of money also in in, in the uh, artificial intelligence field. Uh, we have to be scared about if we cannot control those uh, companies. The future of fake news also depends on it, how control could have the people of the social media platforms. That's, uh, that could be also a very good way to, to fix too many things. Thank you, Prof. Otavio. Now, um, Dr. Rodman, your last words. Uh, first, I agree with everything that you and Octavio and Sabi have said. I don't have much to add to it, except um, we, we need to keep our eyes on three areas, both as educators and as public intellectuals. Uh, in our writing, in our research, in our publication, in our public statements. We need to 
stress the fact that government should be run by people who are not afraid of losing the next election. It's not all about power. You have to do what's right for the people, even if it means you're going to retire from public service because you're not going to have the support of your party. Right now, in the United States, we have a politician named uh, Liz Cheney. You can mm -hmm. uh, use her as an, as an example. She has gone against the Republican Party and said that uh, Trump is a liar and that he should have been impeached and she's against him. And the forces of the party have come up against her and she might lose. But if she loses, she's going to lose honorably. And the same way in the business community, we have to teach a whole new generation of people that it's not all about profit, certainly not short-term profit, that you have to do what's best for the country in order to have a long-term uh, business success. Henry Ford raised the prices of all, not that he was the best humanitarian in the world, but he raised the prices of all his workers so that they could afford automobiles. And he supported the building of roads so that automobiles could be, um, could be used, could be driven. And of course, consumers, you know, all of our students, all of those who read our public pronouncements, they're all consumers in one way or the other. And we have to teach them that it's not all about consumption. So those are our three big audiences, government, it's not all about power. Mm -hmm. Business, it's not all about short-term profit. Mm -hmm. And consumers, it's not all about who has the most toys when they die. That's my final word. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I, I wish we can go on and then on and on and on and on, but um, it's rather unfortunate. Um, we need to wrap up. So. Um, um, gentlemen, thank you very, very, very much for your insightful contribution. You've really done justice to this topic. And I firmly believe that um, our audience are going out there having more insight as to how we can all help tackle the problem of fake news menace. Um, it's been the 20th edition of communication talk series and today we looked at fake news and how to detect it around the globe thank you um ladies thank you. and gentlemen thank um, you. Thank you. this was fun yeah it was fun yeah it was fun, really. it was fun. Really. Yeah. It was fun.